Welcome to Creating a Business While You're Traveling. My name is Dante St. James. It's locked down in Darwin at the moment. Not much change for me because this is pretty much where I work from usually anyway. So I'm glad to see you here. Hopefully things are safe and well where you are in Australia, across Western Australia, the Northern Territory and Queensland. There's uh, lots of different things going on with this uh, current pandemic, but hopefully you're in a position where things are going well for you. Let's get that screen shared and get underway. I'll just have to count it down because uh, my computer's a little slow this morning, which is uh, not that usual for a very, very expensive computer. Let's get it going and we're nearly there. And we're on. A quote here from an actor, comedian and singer who uh, she actually played an amazing role in a Harry Potter musical, um, which was not officially sanctioned by the Harry Potter people. Uh, it's Jamie Lee Beatty, Jamie Lynn Beatty, who said jobs fill your pocket, but adventures fill your soul. And while that might be correct, we still got to make money along the way. Otherwise it's completely and utterly useless because we really do need to make sure that our adventures that we might like to have also have to be sustainable. They have to be something that we can do, something we can sustain, something that we can continue to do um, through, you know, all the travels, all the adventures and all that, but someone still has to pay for them all. Thankfully, I managed to find different ways to get people to pay for these through government programs or through different uh, providers that I work with. So how do I do it? You're going to learn a bit of that along the way. What we're going to look at today is what my personal experience of work travel has been, the types of businesses that really do suit the travel lifestyle, and also the pros and the cons, and there's some cons, trust me on this, of work travel, or particularly when you're using your work as a method to do a lot of travel. This is brought to you by Business Station and the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program in conjunction with Regional Development Australia in Brisbane, Queensland and Treaty Business Consulting in the Northern Territory. Uh, you've got to also watch this a little bit later on via YouTube. If you're watching this in the later on via YouTube, you can get in touch with me by putting those uh, comments down below and I'll be able to answer those uh, pre fairly promptly. But if you're on the live call, as many of you are this morning, um, please do use the, uh, the Q&A and chat windows as part of Zoom to help us to have a chat about what those issues or questions you have might be. A little bit about me, uh, my name being Dante St. James, I've studied uh, marketing, communications and business information systems at the University of New South Wales, following up by extensive study through the Chartered Institute of Marketing and some micro-credentials through TAFE New South Wales. I like to keep myself nice and sharp. I also do a lot of credentials each year through Facebook themselves, through the Blueprint Certified um, process. I'm a lead trainer, which means um, I, I can train people across Australia officially from Facebook and unofficially as well through individual arrangements, a digital marketing associate and digital marketing associate trainer, as well as a media planning professional. I'm currently in the process of um, being a, uh, accredited as a creative strategist and also as a, now what I might put it down as, it was as a media buyer and also as a community manager. I also work with Google's Digital Springboard program, bringing digital literacy across Australia to various not-for-profits and businesses, um, and as well as being very heavily involved in a number of government programs, more specifically the ASBAS Digital Solutions program that this is part of, and the New Business Assistance with NICE program, helping new businesses get started with the best possible advice and, I guess, um, support from the government as they do that. So my own story when it comes to the travel and the business side of things is that it's a bit of a mixed bag and it all started a long time ago when um, I, I first took a work flight from Sydney to Brisbane with an employer of mine. An employer, I'm trying to remember who they were now, it was um, the people, that they went on to become what is now known as Vodafone. So they were Hutchison at the time um, who had a product called 3 because they had 3G phones because that was really big back then. So imagine this is quite some time ago. And um, 
part of my work with them involved me going to train some people in the business, uh, the Brisbane office. Now that was um, lots of fun. It was my first real work trip that I'd been sent on a plane for and it flew Ansett Australia who um, the flight attendant, things were very, very different in the nineties. The flight attendant um, made it very clear that he wanted to get me drunk. So, and he very successfully did that. And of course, not so drunk that I was able to not walk when I got off the flight. Um, I was very, very capable of getting on there and getting to my hotel and getting the work part of my business trip away. But what had happened is logging, um, so going into a hotel, um, so eating from the room service menu, all that kind of thing, it made me hungry for this work travel thing. It wasn't the process of flying. It wasn't the, um, the staying in hotels or the expense accounts or anything like that. Um, I also got to Melbourne too as part of this. It wasn't that at all. All it was a part of was really that I wanted to, that, that I enjoyed meeting new people and seeing new towns and new places. It was a really, really effective way to, I guess, notice how to different people lived in different cities, different cities I'd spent very little time in in the past. And it would lead me to want to have a much broader lifestyle around this kind of thing. Then um, many years later, when I was in a, uh, a radio network that I was working for, I had to do some work interstate quite often. And I lived in different states. So I lived in uh, Queensland at one stage, lived in Victoria, one stage in Sydney as well, and in Darwin with this particular network. And what they did, they sent me to um, a lot of different places. And one of those places they sent me to for quite some period, which was six weeks, in fact, was uh, to Geelong in Victoria to help them out. And Geelong, um, halfway through that sort of um, that, that period of being there, staying in an Airbnb, I also got um, to go to Tasmania and to Adelaide and the Adelaide Hills um, as part of what I needed to do for my job there. Um, that really, really further whetted my appetite to want to do a lot more work travel and in such a way that I, I no longer, I guess, um, saw work travel as this frivolous thing. I saw it, the, the, the ability of the power of getting in front of people live is Instead of relying on phone calls, um, Skype calls were really bad back then. Uh, we didn't have Zoom, we didn't have Microsoft Teams, we didn't have these more stable video environments. And the MBN was, um, I don't even think it was being rolled out at that stage, it was so long ago. So it's one of those things where we're waiting for better internet and we're waiting for better facilities and services to be able to enable the digital economy in a better way than what it was. Um, then that led to in 2015, wanting to set up a lifestyle where I actually had three home bases. I'd have one in Sydney, one in uh, Melbourne. I've got a picture of Brisbane there, but it was actually going to be on the Gold Coast. And I was going to shuttle between the three of those, depending on where I wanted to be at the time. Um, why did I want to do that? Well, at the time I had no partner. I had no um, commitments in any one place. My job was completely and utterly uh, mobile and working remotely. So it didn't require me to be in any particular one place at any particular one time. So what it gave me was this appetite to experience the best of all three cities. Um, in Sydney, I had access to the head office of the company I was working for. In Melbourne, um, I didn't really have any reason to be there whatsoever, except for the fact that I really liked Melbourne at the time. And in Brisbane, the Gold Coast, it was because my, my family are there. And so I was looking forward to being closer to them at various stages. But that's led to now a lifestyle, which is more about me um, being for short periods in different times in different places. So flying about from Darwin, where my home base is, where I am at the moment in lockdown, um, around all different parts of Australia. So this year I've been to a lot of different places. You can see I'm flying to Brisbane from Darwin. I do a lot of little TikTok and um, and Instagram reels uh, photo with a very good colleague in Mackay Airport from the split spaces there. And remote working absolutely sucks in Broome, Western Australia, where I was actually legitimately spent half a day working from Cable Beach, because why wouldn't you when you're able to? But that then, of course, led me way further afield to, I guess, more... Um, more strategic view of what it is. What my aims are is ultimately I want to spend more time with my parents. Um, I'm in my late forties now, so you can imagine my parents are getting on a bit. I wanted to see more of regional Australia. I wanted to make new friends right across the country. I also wanted to diversify my revenue base outside of the NT. So now that I've got a business, I'm no longer an employee. Um, I see the dangers of putting all my eggs in one basket. As we know from COVID, um, relying upon one source of income or one place to get your income from 
uh, was quite dangerous. So what I would like to do is diversify my revenue so I'm not so dependent upon what's happening in any one particular place in Australia. Also, I'd also like to take my parents on road trips where it's, um, you know, the, the road trips for work where it's appropriate. So if I'm, you know, they live in between Brisbane and the Gold Coast. So if I've got something on the north coast of New South Wales or in southeast Queensland, it'd be nice to take them along with me, pop them in a motel room, let them explore the town with the car. I work or work for the day, come back, have dinner with them at night and interact more with my family. Um, it might sound a little silly, I know, but it's one of those things I really like to do to spend a bit more quality time traveling a bit with them. And ultimately, I guess, is to live a life worthy of telling stories about. It's a life where I feel like I can... I've achieved a lot more than just simply got to the end of it and died with a with a bank account in in the in the in the black. Um, I, I feel like there's more to life than that, and I'd like to have more to life than that. I don't have um a, a, I don't have a partner. I don't have children. I don't have um the the usual um commitments that people generally have. So I wanted to see myself have a chance to do something more than that uh, because I had the opportunity. It's quite a blessing in my life to be able to be this free. So as part of that, I've had to transform my business from being very much about being um, in person in Darwin to being a lot more mobile to what is called a remote business. And this is where I suppose you can start to understand the differences between the different kinds of these remote businesses being primarily digital nomad work, um, which is very well known as people, I guess, who work in cafes in Bali these days, um, a nomadic business that actually travels um, and it requires travel. And I'll have a look at these in a bit more detail in a sec. And finally, what the remote business is. And this is what I'm trying to build at the moment myself. Now, when it comes to digital nomads, these are people who use um, you know, mobile phones, the internet to earn a living and conduct their life in a relatively nomadic manner. They don't want to be sort of pinned down in one place. They want to hop in a caravan or they want to hop in a plane or they want to hop on a on a tuk-tuk and go somewhere else to work from and live from for that period of time. They're um, people who, um, they're not necessarily paying for rent back home in Australia. They're paying for their rent where they are. So they don't have a home base in Australia necessarily. They're, they're conducting all their life and business overseas. Now, workers like these are often working remotely from you know, foreign countries. Um, Bali is a very big favorite. Um, the Philippines, uh, where else? Uh, Thailand was very popular there for a while. Um, and they're conducting their life in such a way that they can then go to coffee shops, um, libraries, public spaces, um, co-working spaces are very popular all over the world. Or they can work out of the back of their four-wheel drive or their caravan or their RV, um, kind of like what I was doing in Perth, I suppose. That was a very nomadic thing. Now, these are um, often people who have a set client base who they can just get this ongoing work from, and they just perform that work digitally via computer um, all over the world. Something like this, when you're sitting over a rice paddy in Bali, um, drinking coffee and using internet, and I guess, whacking on those headphones and shutting out the world and looking at the beautiful view and enjoying the fresh air and the sunshine and all those wonderful things that we think go with, I guess, um, being a digital nomad in places like Bali. And this is this shot particularly is from Bali. And there's lots of co-working spaces just like this where people go to work from um, and they look out over rice paddies and old beaches or different views and vistas, which are quite beautiful. And then they're able to um, get their work done as remotely as they can. Now, nomadic business is slightly different. This is more of the traditional traveling businesses, you know, the uh, carnivals and circuses and um, touring artists and performers, uh, tour guides, all those sort of things. People who, for their job, they actually have to go from place to place. This could be including truck drivers, bus drivers, um, people who do logistics transport from place to place. Um, they, If they're not um, so much doing a job and they're doing their own business in this manner, then it's a little bit different because... Um, they, they, they're, they've got a job and they go and they get their pay and all that and it's dependent upon them getting the job done. Whereas it's a nomadic business, um, I'm talking more about the carnies and um, <clears throat> uh, touring artists and those kind of things. Uh, if they don't tour, they don't make money. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but people who uh, sign recording deals and make music these days don't actually make money really out of the, the recordings or out of the, um, the music itself. They make money out of touring.
And um, that's one of those things where they have to pay and handle all their touring costs as well. So it becomes a business for them. It's not just simply um, working for the record company. They've actually got to run their own business and organize their own tours, which is a big thing. So we're talking about, I guess, you know, where you're taking equipment, you're taking services or something on the road with you. This is um, where you're, you might be on a traveling market as well. That sort of thing is a, is a traveling nomadic business as well. If you're following a market circuit or the show circuit, I know that every state has its field days and its show circuits and um, it's, um, you know, ag fests and things like that, where it's traveling all around the state. And, and um, where I'm in Northern Territory, we're just about to ungo ours as well. Um, August is usually the, the show month. So that's usually where we have the shows traveling up from Alice Springs through Tennant Creek, Catherine, and then to Darwin. Um, whether it'll happen this year is, um, I guess, up for debate. It's supposed to happen. It didn't happen last year, but it's supposed to happen this year. Now, a remote business is a complete other thing. This is where the business can run remotely from pretty much anywhere at all and doesn't require any sort of physical presence in any particular place. So it doesn't require a rented property, a shop front, uh, an office or anything like that or it doesn't require the person to be physically located themselves in any one particular place. Now this is kind of where I'm leading to, but I'm not quite there yet because um, so much of my business still relies on me being in Darwin and being present for events in Darwin. So these kind of things can see you doing things like um, working from hotel rooms as I quite often do. I'll be setting up my MacBook Pro, um, often take a little ring light with me as well. And I'll take my external camera and microphone because I want to sound good. I want to be presentable when I do these things. These webinars don't stop just because I'm in a hotel room in Mackay. Um, it still has to come with me and I still have to conduct these webinars and tutorials and the one-to-ones and Zoom calls and Teams calls and all those kind of things have to come with me. So when we do this, we got to go into a place where we go, well, we have to understand that things aren't always going to be particularly convenient. Whilst I'm at my home base in Darwin, I've got access to a big desk and massive monitors and my perfect ring light, a lovely view over Francis Bay and 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 really good NBN internet, like really seriously good internet. But when I'm on the road, I'm using hotel internet, caravan park internet sometimes, and a lot of the time it's internet that's on one of these things on a mobile phone. So you're relying upon mobile networks. And I've got a bit to say about that a little bit later on, which kind of gives an idea of what you can expect out of these um, mobile networks when it comes to, I guess, understanding how they work in different areas of Australia, particularly the areas that you might be in. And it's a very big difference, I'll tell you that. Now, COVID-19 did change the way that we did this sort of thing. So people like me who do travel a lot for work, uh, we used to be in places like Bali, Thailand, the Philippines. Um, in 2019, I was in Bali three times for two weeks at a time. So six weeks of my year was actually dedicated to living in Bali and working from over there. And it was beautiful. It's a great place to live and be. It's cheap. Um, it's certainly cheaper than living in Darwin, I'll tell you that. But it's uh, one of those places where you do eventually have to come home. Um, a lot of people have, are living there. I've got a friend, Simone, who's also a colleague who lives over there permanently now. She doesn't have really much of a need to come back. Uh, she didn't come back for COVID-19 simply because she was in a position where she worked from home was almost self-sufficient, um, made enough money uh, remotely to be able to you know, handle her daily needs, her rent, her bills, her um, everything she needed. And so she was in a position where she was quite happy to uh, continue doing what she was doing over there. In 2020, though, that all swung around, and especially in 2021, uh, we sort of started flooding out of the cities, such as Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. Not so much Brisbane. Brisbane actually gained population. But Sydney, Melbourne particularly, um, started to empty out a bit and go to places like Tasmania, which was considered to be so COVID-free. The Northern Territory, which until, re re until recently also COVID free and to places like Cairns and Townsville, um, even, you know, places like Port Macquarie, Coffs Harbour, the, um, the Barossa Valley, out to Margaret River in Western Australia, places where they were way out of where all the problems seem to be, particularly in Melbourne, but also, I guess, more recently in Sydney as well. My plan was to spend a third of my time in Bali, 
a third of my time in southeast Queensland and a third of my time in Darwin and the Northern Territory. Um, that was my plan. That was my 2021. That's what it was supposed to turn out like. Um, and sorry, my 2020 was supposed to turn out like this. I had made plans. I'd made arrangements to head to Bali. I had a place I was going to be renting. I was going to be there for you know a month and then I'd go to southeast Queensland for a month and then I would go to Darwin for a month and I had everything set up ready to go and then that nasty little bug came and sideswiped us all and just shut that down altogether. So travel last year was difficult interstate. Um, it did get better towards the end of the year, but it did have some massive problems early in the year. So it wasn't something that was it wasn't possible for me to do any of this. Instead, what ended up happening, I ended up um, on the road this year particularly. Now, last year, I was very fortunate to be able to travel a lot around the Northern Territory, which was to places like Nulanboy, um, Groot Island, uh, Tennant Creek, Catherine, Alice Springs, and various other places, Bachelor and Litchfield National Park, Kakadu, Jabiru, places like that. Um, unfortunately, though, um, then, you know, things changed to a degree that I guess we still couldn't travel overseas, so my plan was put on hold again. I thought, well, 2021 will be my year. But instead, 2021 has got the same travel restrictions overseas. We've been for well over a year now unable to travel overseas um, or to live overseas and come back. So there's things like, for instance, um, you know, I've been pretty much working out of Darwin, Cairns, Alice Springs, Broome, Coffs Harbour, Port Macquarie, Bundaberg, Townsville, Mackay. This half of the year, I've also been in Brisbane and the Gold Coast as well, but these places were places where I was significantly um, going to be. And then the rest of the year, I've, I've still got to face a, a number of other places. So we get Wollongong, uh, Yalara, Bega, Queanbeyan, uh, Yass, Melbourne, Barossa Valley, Gold Coast and Perth are all on my radar for the rest of this year. So it's clear that there is a, an opportunity for me to still do a lot of travel, COVID notwithstanding, um, making sure that doesn't get in the way of it. I've got some trips coming up to uh, Wollongong, um, Coffs Harbour and Port Macquarie in the next three weeks. So I'm really hoping that all this lockdown and this uh, Delta variant stuff is taken care of because um, it's not looking great right now. So if that kind of model is something you want to do, if that kind of way of living seems appropriate for you, if that's the sort of thing that you look at and go, you know what, I wouldn't mind doing some of this at all, then we need to find the kind of business types and business models that are going to suit this kind of work. And we're not just talking about jobs, like getting remote jobs, although you can do that as well. Um, there are plenty of companies that still hire remotely, but may need you to come back to a home base every so often. But in this case, we'll look at, I guess, the, the business types that you can form. They're going to help you to be able to you know, power and pay for travel around Australia. Now, the number one lot of skills that are in demand are digital skills. So things like programmers, coders, and developers who really don't need to be in office. They work from um, GitHub and different um, code repositories. They don't really require to be in any one particular place at one particular time. These kind of workers tend to be quite um, uh, independent and prefer to be independent contractors rather than being tied to any one company at one time. There are differences though in different people. So being someone who has these skills, you could be someone who could form a, a sole trader, independent contractor business around that. Another one is website designers. That's a pretty obvious one. We see a lot of um, uh, remote website designers doing quite well out of times such as COVID and doing quite well out of um, the ability to be able to work from home, whether they're working from home for a company or they've set up their own business to do this. Um, I'm talking mostly about those who are setting up their own web design businesses. You don't have to build hundreds of websites every year. My agency builds around about 50 to 70 a year on average, um, but that's I'm not doing that on my own. I couldn't possibly build that many webs. Oh, possibly could if I was doing nothing else, including travel. Um, social media managers are a pretty popular breed when it comes to this kind of setting up of a business. Um, being able to be a remote social media manager uh, is pretty cool. That said though, you do need to have an idea of where your client's at, particularly if your client is um, serving a localized area. They want to know that you understand their localized area, that you understand the type of clients they've got, that you understand, I guess, the kind of people that they deal with every day. And that may require some on the ground experience or knowledge. Um, just looking up the Australian Bureau of Statistics stats is probably not going to quite cut it. 
Um, things like data entry, if you've got a data entry business where, for instance, you are helping people to, um, I guess, enter their receipts into uh, Zero or Myob or QuickBooks or something like that, that could be something that's really good for you if that's what you can do for a job. Um, you can also get that sort of thing, I guess, on a... Um, subcontracted basis through things like Fiverr, um, Airtasker, those kind of things. Um, then when it comes to graphic designers, uh, that's again, very much like website designers. You can do that from pretty much anywhere you like. You don't necessarily need localized knowledge for this kind of thing like you need with social media managers. Um, it's just producing um, a particular thing using certain tools such as Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, the same goes for course creators, people who are building online courses for clients. Um, they don't necessarily need to be anywhere in specifically to be able to do those because the recordings are often done by the client and then the course creator puts that together in a system like um, Kajabi or Guru Can or um, Podia, things like that. And then digital content creators, so video um, editors, uh, canvas specialists, uh, people who can work with Adobe InDesign to create online magazines and posters, that kind of stuff's very closely related to graphic design, but may also involve video. That kind of stuff doesn't necessarily need to, need to be somewhere unless you are making video that requires footage to be taken of the particular location or people involved in that business locally. So that's where you might strike a few problems with being a content creator for video. Though, you know, footage can be taken by almost anyone on a mobile phone these days. So the client can take their own footage, send it to you, you package it up, make it look great, and then you become a digital content creator. So other skills that may also come to the fore with this, bookkeepers and accountants, um, again, can pretty much be anywhere they like. They can create a business um, traveling all around Australia or the world for that matter, um, and still be able to log into cloud systems like Zero, Biop, uh, QuickBooks, uh, Reckon, any of those online systems and cloud systems to do with financials, um, they can log into and very successfully make a good business out of that kind of thing. Business advisors like myself and trainers and facilitators also like myself are in a position where we can run independent contracted businesses anywhere in Australia and the world and allows us, I guess, to look at um, the ability to, to, to deliver what we're delivering in a digital format. So with the rise of things like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Meet, all these tools allow us to use our computers our phones even if we don't have a computer or our iPads um, and plug it into an internet connection somewhere and we're able to connect and conduct our business as a life coach, an instructor, a tutor, a trainer, a facilitator, an advisor, any of those um, high touch things that we used to do face to face in person um, in an office. Now we tend to do just as competently with someone who we really like through the internet. And finally, we've got the sales oriented businesses. Now these ones vary wildly between, um, I guess the things that people naturally think of as businesses and the things that people don't necessarily, um, you know, might not necessarily think of as being a business, but they'll think of, oh wait, that actually is um, something that makes money. So that might actually be a business. So we're talking about things like affiliate marketing. Now affiliate marketing is where you essentially do the selling for someone else. Let's just say someone's selling protein powder um, and you have a blog online or a social media following and you then put a sale on for that protein powder that you're selling for someone else and you get a cut of what you take. So if you say sell 10,000 units of that protein powder and you get uh, $10 per package of that $50 protein powder, then you're walking away with $100,000. So it's pretty, um, it's a pretty great thing to be able to talk or to be able to work on because it allows you to make money for doing relatively little. Network or multi-level marketing is what we traditional think is um, those pyramid schemes. So it's a lot of things where, hey, come into this, buy these products to get started. Then you know you just got to grow your network of people who are going to you know do the hard work for you. You're going to get um you know six of your friends, and then they'll get six of their friends, and before you know it, you'll be a multimillionaire on a yacht and driving a Bentley. Um, now, as we all generally know, uh, these multi-level marketing and, and pyramid schemes are never really truly um, benefiting those who are new to it. They benefit the people who are the first in or the founders are making all the money. 
So um, they rely a lot upon gullibility of people to think that they can live this, you know, carefree lifestyle and of yachts and retirement at the age of 35 if they sell um, this particular protein powder or this cosmetic or this particular smelly oil stuff. So look, I'm not a massive fan of it myself, but some people do very well out of network and multi-level marketing. And this is something which by and large does allow you to do it remotely. You don't have to manage a team in person. You don't have to hold in-person events. You can hold webinars, you can hold information sessions, all of them through Zoom or Microsoft Teams. And then there's the demonstration products and the market stall holders. These are people who are taking product to things like markets all around Australia. So they don't necessarily um, park for a season, say in Darwin, where they'll do the prep markets for the dry season, then move on to somewhere a little bit cooler once the weather starts to heat up. They're the kind of people who just take their stuff on the road. So a lot of artists, a lot of craft people, a lot of people who... Um, you know, will buy a large amount of um, something from China that they can demonstrate. So, you know, the, it slices, it dices, it juliennes kind of crowd that are buying a food um, processing machine, buying knives, and they want to sell those on the road as well. These are all options that you can have for starting a remote business that goes well beyond just your own home and allows you to stretch yourself out to a much broader market um, all around Australia. Essentially, you can follow the markets um, circuit and go from one town and one city to the next and completely live your life remotely. So that's all very well that you can do these things, but what are the products and services that are actually in demand at the moment? So we're looking at those things which people actually want to buy, not necessarily the things you necessarily want to sell. Um, your your hobbies may be to, I don't know, macrame, some pot plant holders, but is there a demand for those particular macrame pot plant holders? The kind of things that are very much in demand, as you would probably expect, are digital oriented. Things like digital archers, um, copywriters are also very in demand. People who can write very convincing stuff that helps people to buy stuff. Um, people who are also able to write for SEO through copywriting, very, very much in demand right now, especially those who have a track record of doing very well at this. Web designers are always in demand. There's always someone who needs a website or a website fixed or a website supported or a website uh, completely pulled down and started again. So they're never really going out of fashion. Our tutors and teachers, very much in demand as well. They're the kind of people who can um, hop on to, like the old school of the air, I guess, which used to be conducted by radio and is now conducted by the internet. Um, that kind of stuff is still very much in demand for people who teach specific skills, not necessarily teachers who teach kids. I'm talking about specific skills, such as digital skills could be one, craft skills, um, vocational skills, life skills can all be taught via Zoom, Microsoft um, Teams, and Google Meet. Then they've got the coders and the programmers who are very much in demand everywhere in the world. They cannot get enough of them in Silicon Valley in America, cannot get enough of them in Israel at the moment, cannot get enough of them in Germany right now, as um, I think Berlin is where the center of coding seems to be there. In Australia, it's Sydney. And yes, we can't get enough of them either here in Sydney. Even in Darwin, um, we've got constant demand for people who can program and code as people who write code. Project managers can do things remotely. Um, when you're a project manager working with a team of contractors, particularly on things like work sites for homes, for construction, um, even for you know, IT projects and for um, you know, marketing and, and new product development pro projects, the project manager doesn't necessarily have to be there on the ground with people. Whilst it might be great to be building rapport with a team by being in the same location as them, these days, the team could be based in 15 different locations around the world, and it's just simply not going to work out to have everybody in the one place, let alone have the project manager travel to all 15 places. So that kind of work is also very much in demand when it comes to, I guess, the, um, the process of building a remote business. Digital trainers like myself, well, um, I've, I've got a lot of work through that, so I'm doing a lot of work at... Um, you know, helping people to learn new digital skills, to learn new business skills, to grow their businesses and expand what they're doing right now into something bigger and broader. So that's something which um, is very much in demand as well right now. Digital advisors, people who do one-to-one -one, um, sessions such as through the ASBAS Digital Solutions, 
also still very, very much in demand, um, but it also takes a bit of time and effort for you to, I guess, um, work out how are you going to get clients? Because the the difference between, I guess, um, this Asbash Digital Solutions for me and, for instance, being employed by someone is that my employer is responsible for bringing in the work for me. I don't have to go and get work myself. They do that for me. In the case of Asbass Digital Solutions, I very much generate my own work. So I do all these extra webinars that, that are um, enabling me to get more well known and for people to want to do more of the one-to-one -one sessions with me, which are quite paid well. So what products and services then require you to create that demand, to bring in the new clients? Because there's some products and services which are they're in demand and very much in demand on their own and they will bring in clients and people wanting to buy stuff all the time. But what are the products and services that you need to have you create that demand? And I would say the first thing is like affiliate programs. You need to sell, 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 sell that stuff. You need to create that sort of stuff through Facebook ads, Google ads, uh, being present online, being a bit of a video personality can be very helpful for that as well. Multi-level marketing and network marketing schemes are definitely something where you need to generate the work. You need to generate the new leads. You need to generate the new um, prospects and bring them through a sales funnel that allows you then to be able to um, turn them into uh, representatives of that business as well. So that's something you definitely can't get away with automating and no one's gonna be doing the marketing for you. You really need to do that sales yourself. Things like live workshops that you're doing in a town. For instance, I did a couple in um, um, Bundaberg recently, which um, I partnered with another organization to um, do the marketing for that. And they did practically nothing, um, didn't really even try and didn't explain the product properly or the service properly. So I ended up having a bad time in Bundaberg. Not a bad time in Bundaberg, just a bad time of not getting enough people to come in to do the workshop. Um, so it was a bit of a waste of my time and money. That said though, um, I had live workshops in Broome that I promoted myself um, because I couldn't rely upon anyone else to, to promote them. So I had to promote them myself and got a full house and got plenty of people in. People who are performers, so they're wanting to get people into their, their music shows, their theater shows, their comedy shows. Uh, they are then also responsible for all their own marketing. Um, Amy Hetherington, one of my favorite uh, comedians who um, is based here in Darwin, but I think originally from Adelaide. Um, she had this really like big tour she just went on all around regional Australia and, and the north of Australia, the top end of Australia. So one of the places she went to was Broome and I saw her, she had to put up her, um, had people put up her own uh, posters for her. She had to organize her own social media progress, um, her own social media campaigns, her own ads and videos. She had to do all of her own promotions. So you can see that um, there's there's often promoters who will do a lot of that stuff for you. But when you're a small promoter, a small um, performer who isn't that well known nationally yet, um, you're not a Jim Owen, you're not a um, you know, you're not in excess or that's probably a bad example. Let's just say instead of in excess, let's say um, He's always, Jimmy Barnes is always touring. Not Jimmy Barnes who kind of sells himself as soon as we know that he's coming to town, you know, you know he's gonna get lots of bookings done. Um, In-person services, services that require you to do something like massage and personal services and anything like that, which is all about really um, making sure that um, you're delivering health and well-being services or you're doing in-person consultations, that kind of thing, then you're not gonna be able to get that, that same effect where you're going to have um, people then um, finding out about you just through chance or through through a promoter who's local. You'll have to do all of that yourself. In-person consultations, very much the same. You are responsible for letting people know that you exist, letting people know that you're available, letting people know that you're going to be in town. So it's a very different approach that needs you to do a little bit more than just simply sit there and put a couple of posts on Facebook. Then if we move along, then we're getting to the point where we go to um, the things that I suppose really concern clients when it comes to working with people who work remotely. When people work remotely, um, they then are in that position where they can have things go wrong. And clients can sometimes get very um, jumpy and afraid of this. So things such as um, having that 
always on holiday attitude. Um, I've had that one thrown at me before. It's like, how do you stay motivated when you always seem to be on holidays? I'm like, well, they're not holidays. Um, I choose hotels where I can work very deliberately. I choose locations where I can work and make money. I have to work very hard and often work really late into the night where I am simply because um, nobody else is going to do the work for me. I need to do all that work myself. Um, there's the whole thing with clients don't like it when you start working with them locally and then you suddenly switch to remote work. I know a, an organization in the Northern Territory who was working with a social media manager who started locally and producing amazing work. Um, she then decided, okay, now I've got this big, um, this big, uh, contract i'm just going to go to bali and live over in bali for six months and i'll just contract um the photography and the local work to someone here um didn't really get a clarity out of the client that that would be okay and just went and did it anyway and of course some um, client wasn't particularly happy with that and she eventually lost that contract which caused her to have to move home because she lost all of her her back home contracts um, things like time zone differences can be a little um a little bit bad because uh, clients like to stay in touch and that staying in touch is often um, not just like by phone or by Zoom call or anything like that. We're talking about sitting down and having a coffee, meeting in the office and, and doing that schmoozing you have to do with a client. Um, and if they don't get that and they kind of were expecting that, those time zone differences can make a big difference and mean that everything is done sort of in an awkward time that sort of suits both of you. Now, if you're just in Bali, that's not so bad. If you're in Fiji, also not so bad or Vanuatu. But once you get somewhere like on, in America or Europe, or um, South America or uh, Africa, then you're in time zones that really don't suit uh, people here. So for instance, if you're thinking, you know, there could be a 14 hour time difference um, between you and where you're coming from. So it makes it really, really difficult to conduct a personalized and very in-person feeling uh, Zoom call. There's a lot of unanswered emails that happen with um, remote workers as well. And I can be guilty of this one a lot myself because we do tend to get busy. We tend to have to take on a lot of extra work because even though um, if you're just wanting to work remotely from one place, the cost of living could actually be lower than what it is if you were in one other place. When you're like me and you're constantly traveling, it actually is an expensive lifestyle and you do have to be paying for a lot of travel, a lot of hotels, a lot of um, apartments, a lot of um, you know, caravans, even some places you have to stay in a caravan. So it can mean that you need to um, be very, very busy and take on a lot of work to be able to cover that. And then you can't always respond to every single email as it comes in, simply because it takes time to read through them, time to reply to them, time that you may not have if you're in the middle of a whole lot of projects at the moment, which is kind of related to, I guess, that great client fear, which is about, um, their, their contractors disappearing without notice. And this happens so, so often. I've had contractors work for me who just disappear for two weeks. They just stop responding. They're non-responsive. They don't um, talk to you. They just disappear. And it happens quite a lot, I guess, with um, when you're working uh, with people in the Philippines. Life is hard for them because they don't often live in a place where they have any privacy. They need to go to like um, cafes to work from. They don't have a work place or work space that they can easily get to. So they're often disappearing without notice um, because they're simply not able to work, but they don't tell you that because there's a lot of shame involved in that. They feel like they're letting you down, even though they're still very happy to accept you still paying them. Um, you dropping projects midway through is a great risk that a client will have to take. It's where they really truly believe that um, you know there's a good opportunity for you if you're not in town to stay uh, to stay accountable that you may end up dropping the project midway through and abandoning them. Or sudden outsourcing is another thing. You move to Bali and start working with a lot of Balinese staff or an Indonesian staff, and next thing you know that they're dealing with someone called um, Katut, and rather than dealing with someone called Jennifer. So it's um, a, a real fear that clients go through. And they also worry that they're going to have to be forced into, and this is related to the sudden outsourcing, people who they can't understand. So you start outsourcing your um, contacts through the Philippines, start outsourcing some of your, your um, creative work through Indonesia. Then people, they just feel a little bit um, like they've been abandoned. They can't understand very easily the people they're working with now because they were used to working directly with you. The stuff, though, that comes with remote work and remote business that clients don't worry that much about includes things like um, patching internet connections. We all understand those because we get those ourselves in Australia. I get them all the time. 
so much when I was over in Broome, so much when I'm in Alice Springs and remote areas. Things like Zoom calls, they don't actually mind them that much. Um, they're, they're okay, they're used to them now, especially in 2021, we've had a year and a half of getting used to what these things are, so we get it now. But they're not, they're not worried about casual dress, although I always try to wear a collared shirt when I do things like this, because it's just out of respect for my audience and out of respect for my clients that I go to some kind of effort to, um, to, to look semi-professional, I suppose. Um, oh, the communication where you're constantly sending through messages to them. That's not something that really affects a client that greatly. Um, clients really want to be let known and they will let you know if there is over communication there. They'll just say, hey, you don't have to send me like every single thing. Just give me a highlight once a day and that might be enough. Days off with notice. So when you let the client know that you're not gonna be available on Wednesday because you have something on, they don't hate you for that because they're not your employer, they're a client and it's your business to essentially run as you see fit. People don't mind not being able to reach you if they know that you're on a day off. So if you let people know in advance that you're on that day off, having your out of office replies and your email there, it makes it a lot easier. Um, they don't really care where you are in the world as long as they don't feel a difference. So for instance, you could be sitting in a cafe in Marseille in France and they'd be completely okay with that as long as the work is getting done. Things like slight time zone differences though is a bit different um, because you can keep things relatively normal and communicate with each other in what relatively normal hours within Australia would be. That's why people sort of, um, you know, a, a few time zones west and east kind of work. So you're talking about from maybe, you know, New Zealand, I'd go back as far as maybe, um, maybe Tonga. Um, would be would be a pretty good time zone to go from. So that takes in Tonga, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, New Zealand, Solomon Islands, uh, Cook Islands, uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, where else have we got around there? I can't remember all the different nations. Uh, Fiji, uh, Samoa, and then coming across through Australia, you've got the whole of Indonesia pretty much, Singapore, um, the Vietnamese Peninsula, along with Thailand, um, Myanmar. It's when you get to around about Bangladesh and India that it starts to get a little inconvenient. Um, the, the Indian Ocean is quite a wide ocean. You don't realize just how wide it is. So things like that, international phone calls, I don't mind either. As long as you're making the call and you're paying for it, they don't really mind um, having to have international phone calls. And most of us have a certain amount of international phone calls included in our mobile phone plans these days. Anyway, because who has a landline anymore? So what are the tools of the trade that you'll need to make all this work? The obvious ones, laptop, computer, a phone, um, a microphone, headphones, that sort of thing to help you communicate. Your communications tools will be absolutely vital for you. But I've got a bit of a catch coming up a little bit later on, which um, also explains that you know, they may not be enough. There's also things like your systems. So systems for communicating like Zoom, Skype, um, Google Meet, um, and uh, what else is there? Microsoft Teams, those kind of things. But then also having things like Google's Gmail or G Suite and Microsoft Office 365, uh, the subscription softwares that you're probably gonna need quite heavily. Um, you can get away without Office 365, but I guess the more you use it and the more you have used in the past, the more dependent you do feel upon those tools, particularly Outlook if that's the way you like to do your emails. Things like Adobe Creative Cloud, if you're a creative person making video, making graphics, making um, you know, graphical layouts, making movies as well. Um, Premiere, which is the one on the right, is all about making uh, video. Um, Adobe Illustrator is very much about making layouts for things like posters, magazines, that sort of thing. Um, InDesign is probably even better for that now. Um, and Photoshop for making a lot of web-based designs that you're going to use. Moving on from those though, there's also Canva. It's probably the, the number one graphic tool to be used anywhere in the world right now. It gives you an opportunity to take it on the road because it's 100% local, I'm um, sorry, internet based. So it's nothing, there's no software on your computer that you need for this apart from your web browser. So it means that it's very easy to access and very easy to use anywhere you choose to set up shop in the world. When it comes to Australia for mobile services, when you're going remote and rural, there's pretty there's a lot of places where Telstra is the only option if it's even there at all. So when I go to places like, um, say, Broome, 
Broom's Telstra connection worked okay. It uses the same um, facilities, towers, interconnection um, wires, all that sort of thing as what the other providers do, but they've got more capacity when it gets in there as the national provider. Um, Optus and Vodafone are, I'll just say it now, in regional and remote areas, quite woeful. When you're in the cities though, if you're someone who goes to Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, Darwin, Launceston, Hobart, the major centres like Ballarat, Bendigo, um, you know, Port Augusta, Wyala, Port Lincoln, um, even Margaret River, Geraldton, um, Alice Springs to a lesser degree, Wollongong, down the south coast of Marimbula, places like that, Bega, and then to Newcastle, the central coast, Coffs Harbour, Port Macquarie, Tweed Heads, all those places will be fine for any provider. It's once you get outside those areas, when you get on those country roads, when you get on the interstate highways, when you get into um, places that are a little bit further out of town and in smaller towns and villages, is where Telstra tends to shine. Uh, not because Telstra is necessarily a better technology or a better provider, they just cover more of those areas. They cover a larger percentage of the population. Now you might look at the marketing material and said, oh, Vodafone covers 96% of the population, Optus covers 97, and then Telstra covers 99. You go, well, that's not really much of a difference. But considering how few people live in these remote areas where you may be going, it's important that you have that coverage. So I've got a Telstra phone and a Vodafone phone. I get much more... Um, out of my Vodafone, I get a lot more um, data allowance, but through my Telstra phone, which I get less data allowance on, I get a lot more reliable coverage. I generally find them in when I'm in rural towns as well, that the internet connection is faster through Telstra than it is through Vodafone, although that does change um, sometimes where I go to, for instance, where did I go to where it did this? It was um, a recent trip where I went to, it was Catherine. When I go to Catherine, in the Northern Territory. And when I was in um, Townsville and Cairns, in fact, when I was in the Northern beaches of Cairns at a place called Ellis Beach, um, I had barely any coverage at all with Telstra and it really didn't work that well. But I had sensational full bars coverage with Vodafone of all of them um, in this quite remote place. So it does change. Check the coverage maps before you go away and choose a provider that you feel like is gonna support you the best. In most cases, that will be Telstra you're gonna to need to double up on a lot of things. You're gonna to have to have a spare computer, a spare phone. You're gonna to have to have a lot of your own cables, power boards, connectors, adapters, extension leads, all these kind of things. I've got a little kit that I take with me in this bag that's right here next to me. And in this bag, I've got all that. I've got a power board that has uh, six points on it. I've got a five meter extension lead. I've got all of my extra adapters and, and power leads and HDMI and, and USB adapters and converters a spare computer and a spare phone although i've got a few i've got four phones at the moment but that's my life's weird don't take that as an example of what it should be luggage is going to be important you're going to find that these little wheelie guys are going to be your best friend when you're doing a lot of overnight and two night stays um be bear in mind that you need to take some stuff with you if you're someone who doesn't sleep well without your pillow there's going to come times when you must take your pillow for like a journey of a week or more. But if you're only going for one night, you can live without your pillow. But you may not be able to sleep without your CPAP machine. So you've got to make sure that you've got the kind of luggage that can take that kind of thing. Like a CPAP machine, um, I take one with me. It's a small travel one and it's able to be tucked into my wheelie bag uh, quite comfortably. And I just surround it with clothes. So if that wheelie bag gets thrown around... Um, it will um, not break. The other thing is too, though, if you're going through airport security, things like microphones uh, are best on checked in your under under the cabin luggage. Um, if you don't have checked luggage, um, you will get questioned about the microphone. They'll pull it out, they'll examine it, um, they'll see what it is, and they'll be happy with that. Same with CPAP machines. Um, the same with a, a huge amount of things like wires of them. Um, they'll look for things that are shaped with lots of wires around them that don't quite look like they're really cords or something, especially if you wrap wires around things. That is something you need to watch out for. Now, when it comes to finding clients for all this, you can base it upon your existing clients, clients from where you come from, or clients on the road. So your existing clients are where you're converting your real world clients to come with you on the road 
figuratively. Um, you can hand over local tasks to local contractors and you can keep the tasks to yourself that you can do remotely. When you're looking at clients who are from the same town as you, you have to visit home occasionally to meet these people and advertising, you need to do that in your home market. You need to incentivize existing clients to refer other people they know to you as well. When it comes to clients that you're going to meet on the road, you can set up meetings where you are. You can do free workshops as I tend to do to gauge interest and work at shared workspaces where you're going to meet people straight off the bat who seem to um, know who you are and they get to know who you are to be able to refer you across to lots of other people. The reality of work travel though is not all glamour and lifestyle and business class. In fact, it's very rarely business class. It's a very rare treat to get that. You need to have the, the time to do this. You need to have the technology to support you doing this and you need to have the right kind of temperament because not everything goes right. You are going to be sat next to um, screaming babies on flights. You are going to be put in the hotel rooms next to a fighting couple. You are going to be sat in a restaurant on your own thinking of home and going, I wish I had someone to, to, to dine with tonight. I don't, I don't get to dine with anyone but myself. The reality is it has a big impact on your family and relationships. If you have family, kids, this is not your lifestyle unless you take them with you. And if you do take them with you, there's schooling, all sorts of that sort of stuff. You're going to have to homeschool the kids to do all this sort of thing. Um, it will impact relationships. If you've got a girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, pup, partner at home and you're away two thirds of the time, it will impact your relationship. Familiarity, excuse me, breeds contempt, but familiarity also breeds familiarity and makes you a tighter, stronger unit. And then there's always the fear of missing out. There's the, you're going to miss a lot of stuff when you're on the road. You're going to miss weddings, birthdays, um, nights out with the friends, excuse me, football games with the, with the, with the fellas book club with the girls, whatever it is that you would normally do, you're going to miss all of that sort of stuff. But it does, you know, put you in a position where you go, well, what is, is it actually worth it financially? I've just got the hiccups, I'm afraid. So sorry about that. So when you ask if it's worth it financially, I'd sort of budget all my work trips um, around cost and revenue to find a profit. So for instance, my Townsville trip cost me $1,377, roughly $2,777 of revenue a profit then coming of $1,400. That was a good week's work. There was also a week where I did a very similar figures in Cairns. And then, you know, I was able to make good money from that week. Um, Bundaberg was a bit of a bit of a bust though, because it cost me $1,700 to get there and to be able to do it and hire venues and do it all the stuff I did, but I only made $990 of revenue out of it through um, only a couple of people turning up to the workshops. And then I was able to salvage a bit of that out of getting one-to-one um, -one appointments with people um, in Bundaberg that I could do both there while I was there and also via video calls and Zoom calls while I was back in town. So my profit wasn't a profit. It was a loss of $714, which I had to foot the bill for as a business. Um, but you know, you make this up in the swings and roundabouts of life. And I did that with the broom trip, cost $2,800, made $4,660, made $1,860 of profit on that. And I continue to get that one. That's a gift that keeps on giving. And you never can, like broom is by far the smaller of all those three towns. Um, Bundaberg was a bit of a bust and there's reasons for that because I didn't do my own promotion. I did it through someone else who did a very poor job of it. So is it actually worth it personally though? Well, there's, you're going to be tired. You're going to be sitting in airport cafes, trying to work, trying to do marketing, trying to feel good about things. Um, you're going to hope that there's some kind of in-flight Wi-Fi, and where there's no in-flight Wi-Fi, then you have to do things that you, that don't require in-flight Wi-Fi. So there's always a challenge along the way. But you also have the most magic moments of being able to go and see one of your favorite comedians in Alice Springs while you're there, to see the Todd River flowing a couple of times, to get that view out across the clouds, something you just don't see from home. All those moments and experiences of meeting people that you wouldn't normally get, that's something which allows you to do that, I suppose. You get to see the new kitten that your brother's brought home to your parents' house. You get to watch the view and the sunset over the, over the hills of Cairns while you're on Fitzroy Island. And you get to meet cassowaries and scrub turkeys in the rainforest of the Atherton Tablelands. It's a beautiful way to live if you have the time, the tech, and the temperament to be able to do it. 
And of course, you have moments like these where you're building websites whilst you're facing the ocean at Ellis Beach, north of Cairns, and thinking, you know what? This is the kind of life I signed on for. So is it worth it personally? Well, I guess it depends on who you are. I'd like to thank you for joining me this afternoon, or this morning, sorry. And you can contact me at Dante at treaty.com.au through LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. I do welcome you to stalk me on those. Um, and feel free to reach out if you'd like to talk to me more about how you can do a one-to-one -one consultation with me on this topic or many different digital skills topics through asbas.com.au, asbas.com.au. Thank you so much for joining me. I really, really appreciate you coming aboard. And I really do hope that I'll see you in the next one.